guys, Victoria Paxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so today, probably hear the fan because it's hot as crap. Sorry. You know, it's been in the mid to upper 90s all week and high humidity, and it's just gross outside. So, okay, so today we're talking about Michael Hutchins. So Michael Hutchins was the lead singer of the band In Excess. Um, Michael Kellen John Hutchins was born January 22nd, 1960 in Sydney, South Wales, Australia. So the band In Excess came about in 1979. He co-wrote all the In Excess songs with Andrew Ferris. Okay. So, May 19th, 1984, NXS won seven awards at the Countdown Music and Video Award Ceremony, including Best Songwriter for Hutchins and Andrew, and Most Popular Male for Hutchins. Hmm. Go figure, right? He was really talented. Okay. So, August 1992, Hutchins and girlfriend Helena Christensen they were out walking on a street in Copenhagen. They were drunk as could be. Um, and I guess Michael Hutchins said he refused to move out of the way for a taxi cab driver. So the taxi cab driver beat the crap out of him. He fell backwards, hit his head on the road, proceeded to go home and didn't go for medical help for several days. And when he did go, he ended up being put in the hospital for two weeks in Copenhagen because he suffered a massive concussion. He lost a sense of smell and sense of taste. And as a result, after this happened, he was very aggressive. He would get angry easily. And he was depressed because he had no sense of smell or taste. And I'm here to tell you y'all, that's one of the symptoms of COVID. A friend of mine's son had it and it's been two months. He's been over it for two months and he still can't smell or taste. So that would suck going through life, not being able to smell and taste, you know? Okay. So one of his bandmates beers, uh, said that Hutchins pulled a knife on him and threatened to kill him during the 93 recording of full moon, dirty hearts. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, there was a lot of evidence that he had gotten become really aggressive after this happened. So Hutchins met Yates in 90, no, Hutchins met Yates in 1985 when he was interviewed for her program called The Two. Okay, so in 1994, she interviewed him again, but this time she had a show called The Big Breakfast Show. So basically it was her and she would like lay in a bed and then interview the people, right? So I remember the interview really well. Uh, because there was so much like chemistry between her and him. I mean, it was just like, you could see it, you could feel it. Like, even if you watch it today, like you can definitely tell that there was a lot of chemistry there, like a lot of chemistry. Okay. So Polly Yates, Bob Geldof divorced in May of 96. Okay. So two months later, July 22nd of 96, Yates gave birth to Hutchins only child, a daughter, and here we go. I'm going to butcher this name. How about that? Heavenly Karani Tiger Lily Hutchins. And I know they called her um, Tiger. September 1996, uh, Yates and Hutchins were arrested for suspicion of drug possession after the family nanny reportedly found a small amount of opium in a shoebox under their bed. Question, why was the nanny looking underneath their bed? That's one thing I don't understand. I mean, not that it's right to have drugs under your bed, but you know what I mean. Like, that was just weird. Okay, so the case was later dropped for lack of evidence, all right? So an excess went on a world tour to support the April 97 release of Elegantly Wasted. The final 20th anniversary tour was to occur in Australia in November and December. During the tour... Okay, so during the tour, Paula was going to bring Tiger, her and Michael's daughter, and then she had her daughters by Bob Geldof. So she was going to bring all three kids to see him in Australia. 
like after one of his shows so they could spend Thanksgiving together. So Bob Geldof took legal action to stop that. So November 22nd, 1997, Michael Hutchins was 37 years old. He was found dead in room 524 at the Ritz Carlton in Double Bay, Sydney. Actress Kim Wilson was the last person to physically see Hutchins alive after partying with him in his hotel room prior to his death. Geldof and Yates each gave police statements on the phone calls they had with Hutchins on the morning of his death. Okay, so Yates said she went on to tell Hutchins that um, Geldof had held up the hearing. It was going to be adjourned until December 17th, which meant she wasn't going to be able to come see him at all until after that court date. So Hutchins told Yates he didn't think he could live another day without seeing his daughter and seeing her. Boy, those words. Um, then he said, well, let me, let me call Bob Geldof. L let me talk to him, see if I can convince him. So Geldof told police that he got a call. He, in fact, got a call from Michael Hutchins. And Michael Hutchins was abusive. He was screaming at him, cussing at him, threatening him with everything under the sun. So the person in the hotel room next door to Hutchins said he heard a loud male swearing and screaming at 5 a.m. So that, I guess, lined up with when he had called Bob Geldof. So at 9.54 a.m. on November 22nd, Hutchins spoke with a former girlfriend of his, Michelle Bennett. So apparently they had continued to talk as friends, but they, you know, it was nothing more than a friendship. So he supposedly, according to her testimony, he called her, he was crying and saying he was just over it. You know, he wasn't going to get to see his daughter. He wasn't going to get to see his girlfriend. And he was just beside himself. She said he was just crying uncontrollably. And he was begging her to come over. And she said, you know, she had other stuff going on, but of course he was her good friend. And so she decided she was going to go over. Okay, so she got there at 10.40 a.m., banging on the door, nobody's answering. She couldn't hear anything inside. So at 11.50 a.m., a maid went in to clean Hutchins' room, and she walked in and found him. Yeah. Um, he was found, like, in a kneeling position facing towards the door. He, he used his belt to tie a knot on the automatic door closure. I guess it jerked his head forward so severely that the buckle on the belt broke, in, broke which is... I don't know, it just sounds so horrible and so painful, you know? Um, February 6th of 98, after an autopsy and a coronial inquest, I guess that's something they do in Australia, New South Wales state coroner Derek Hand presented his report. The report ruled that his death was, in fact, a suicide. While, and it said it was a suicide while depressed and under the influence of alcohol and drugs. A blood analysis test indicated the presence of alcohol, cocaine, Prozac, and prescription drugs. In an interview with 60 Minutes, Yates claimed that Hutchins' death might have resulted from autoerotic asphyxiation. So, you know, Yates came out on several different times in several different interviews and said that her and Michael had a pretty active sex life and... Um, that they tried like many, many things. And she said that she could totally see him doing that and dying as a result by accident. But supposedly, you know, they said, oh, there's no way. So I don't know. We'll see, right? You'll see when I talk about my connection. So November 27th of 97, Hutchins funeral was held at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney, Australia. His casket was carried out of the cathedral by members of NXS and his younger brother, Rhett. His song, Never Tear Us Apart, was playing in the background, which, holy crap, I'm sure there wasn't a dry eye in the house, right? Nick Cave, a friend of his, uh, performed Michael's 1997 song, Into My Arms, during the funeral, and it was requested that the television cameras be switched off for that. So I'm sure that was extremely emotional. <sighs> okay, so Rhett, Michael's younger brother, claimed in his book that he wrote in 2004 the book was, is called Total Excess, which I'd actually really like to read that. I'll have to remember that. Um, 
So at the funeral home, at the funeral parlor, he witnessed Yates, Polly Yates, walking up and putting a gram of heroin in Michael's pocket on his shirt. Really? Come on, Yates. It's bad enough that you were doing heroin and he was doing heroin and you had kids and and then you're going to do something like that. That's just uh, people that do that kind of crap. Just the girl didn't have a lot of smarts, I don't think. Okay, so Polly Yates died September 17th of in 2000 of an accidental heroin overdose. Here's what I want to know. Why do they call it an accidental heroin overdose? Do you know anybody that goes out there and says, oh, I'm going to shoot up heroin, heroin so I can overdose? I don't think drug addicts go out there intentionally to shoot up heroin so they can overdose. So why do they always say an accidental drug overdose? I don't know. Pet peeve of mine. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So shortly after Yates died, Bob Geldof assumed foster custody of Tiger so she could be raised with her half-sisters, which, okay. In 2007, Geldof formally adopted her, which that's pretty cool. I mean, you have to admit, the guy may have uh, given Michael and Paula a hard time as far as custody, but, you know, he was probably warranted. I mean, if he knew that they were using drugs like they were, Right. He was just trying to be a good dad. And then for him to turn around and adopt, you know, Michael's daughter. That's awesome. You know, that's really cool. OK, so, oh, the one thing that I forgot. When Polly Yates died of a heroin overdose. Her and Michael's daughter, Tiger, was right there when it happened. Can you imagine that poor child? She was four years old. So. Uh, she was too young to understand that daddy was dead, you know, so she just never saw daddy again. And then on top of it, her mom overdoses in the same room. That poor kid, man. Okay, so yeah, in 2007, he formally adopted her. In 2019, Tiger's legal name became Heavenly Harani Tiger Lily Hutchins Geldof. Okay. So December 12th of 2002, unfortunately, Michael's father, Kellen, died of cancer. In July of 2009, Michael's mother, Patricia Glassip, protested that Geldof had prevented access to her granddaughter, Tiger, for three years, which that really sucks. If he, if Bob Geldof, in fact, did that, that's pretty sad. You know, it's bad enough that Tiger will never get to see her dad again, and then her mom died. You know, so for her not to be able to see Michael's mom and dad, I mean, that just sucks. That's just pathetic. Like, come on, grow up, people. You know, I hate when people use, like, a child, dangle a child as leverage. You know what I mean? So, unfortunately, Michael's mom, she died September 21st, 2010. Okay. So, I was able to connect with Michael. And I will say this, he looked unbelievably well and amazing. You know, he's extremely easy on the eyes, you know. Um, and I'm always attracted to guys with dark hair, dark eyes. I don't know what it is. That's just, and he just had that beautiful curly hair. And when I connected with him, he had the pretty curly hair and he looked healthy and he didn't have acne all over his face, all over his face from using drugs. And, you know, he just, he just looked really vibrant and really good. He, he looked like maybe he was in his thirties, like early thirties, maybe, you know, it, it was much younger, but ugh, girl, he looked good. I don't need that. Um, yeah, that was the thing. I never realized I've always loved In Excess. The song Original Sin is my very favorite song ever, and I told him that. I said, the song Original Sin bypasses every artist that I love, every song that I love. You know, more so than Princess songs, more so than Michael Jackson, more so than Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, whoever. That's like my all-time favorite song is Original Sin. I don't know why, when it came out, I heard it. I remember telling everybody at school, oh my God, you have to hear the song. Like, it's so cool. And everybody was like, oh my God, they suck. Really? But then it was like, you know, a couple months later, all of a sudden, then they were totally in love with the Nexus, talking about what a great band they were. And I'm like, gee, I wonder where you heard them at. 
Anyway. Um, yeah, so anyway, so yeah, he just, beautiful eyes, just just came through and was just very vibrant and happy. You know, he said he was happy to meet me, happy to talk with me, and yeah, pretty wild, y'all. Okay, so did I mention his accent? <clears throat> Ladies, did I mention the boy's accent? Oh my goodness, my heart. <laughs> okay, so he went on to talk about having his mom and dad there and how it was amazing. Um, he talked about he talked about how miserable he's been not being able to physically touch his daughter. Um, yeah, he said that's one of the downfalls. He said he loves where he is. He wouldn't trade it, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. he said, you know. Um, he said it was really different for him when he first saw Paula. So I guess when Paula crossed over and he first saw her, he said, you know, it was tough. And he said, so I thought, oh, you know, tough because he had missed her. And he said, no, it was tough because our, my relationship with her consisted of two things sex and drugs and he said so to not have those things he said it was really different and that he had to adjust and he had to actually they both had to like start over from the beginning and become friends and become acquainted with each other you know and get to know one another so i thought that was pretty wild like okay you know and i told him i appreciate you being completely honest because you know, that's a tough thing to say, you know, and to admit to. I mean, come on. He said it was it was amazing to be able to have quote healthy relationships with people. You know, he said there at the end, his relationship with his dad and his mom, it was strained so bad because he was always touring. When he wasn't touring, he was high or drunk. And he said it was really hard. And so it was nice to be able to start over and rebuild a relationship with them. So yeah. Um, she said, she said, his mom said um, it had been a lot of years since she had been able to talk to him to where he was clean and sober and to where he was her son again, because she said, you know, he had gotten so far gone so quickly. Yeah. So I told him I wanted to talk to him about the end and, you know, and I had some specific questions and I wanted to know if there was anything you didn't want me to ask or say. And he was like, no, you know, I'm open, whatever, whatever you need to ask, go for it. Um, okay. So I asked him how he felt about Bob Geldof raising his daughter, Tiger. And he said, he said, I only wish he would have taken her before Paula died. He said, because Paula was in a really bad place, especially after he died. And he said he didn't want his daughter around that. And he, you know, found out, I guess, that his daughter was there in the room when Paula overdosed and died. And he said, you know, that's, you know, a huge thing for him. A huge regret is that he left Paula and Tiger the way he did. You know, and he said, he said, he didn't feel as bad leaving his mom and dad and his his family and his other friends because he said he was no longer himself. And so he felt like, you know, his parents and his friends and everybody that his family, everybody would, they'd be okay. And they would adjust because he had just become such a jerk, you know, that it was probably, he felt like it was probably a relief to some of them that he was gone, which God, that's so sad, you know, but I mean, it's understandable when you're dealing with an alcoholic and a drug addict. It's, I mean, let's be real, people. Yeah. Okay. So he said, you know, there was a part of him that wished that his mom and dad could have raised Tiger. You know, um, and he said, you know, Bob and I had our share of arguments. He said, but it was usually over stupid stuff like, you know, I wanted to see my kids and... He didn't want the kids around me because he knew I was doing drugs and he knew Paula was doing drugs. And he said, so, you know, I understand 
why he was the way he was with me. Um, yeah, he went on to say that he has no doubt in his mind that Bob loved Tiger and that Bob was good to her. Um, he said, you know, Bob and I had, we had our issues for good reason, but he was a decent guy. So that says a lot. Okay, so I said, okay, I'm going to go on to a couple harder questions. And he was like, okay, shoot. I said, is it in fact true that you died of autoerotic asphy asphyxiation like Paula had stated? And he smirked and he blushed. <laughs> okay, so he goes on to say that, look, I did some really crazy stuff sexually. He's like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I've done a little bit of everything. I was into a little bit of everything. He said, it's embarrassing to talk about it, to think about it today. Um, but he said, no, I absolutely positively did not die from because of that. Okay. I asked him if he would explain what happened. He talked about drinking and doing coke with his friend Kim. Um, he said he had spoken to Paula and Paula had told him that, you know, she wouldn't be able to come with her daughters and with Tiger and for Thanksgiving. And he was really upset, you know, that he wasn't going to be able to see them until December. And he said he was just done. He was done. He was tired of it. He said he was, let's see. He popped several pills. I should have asked him what he popped and I didn't. That he was continuing to drink and that he was getting pretty out of it. You know, he could tell he was really out of it. Um, yeah, he went on to say that the only thing, like, what was getting him through his days was knowing he was going to get to see Paula and Tiger. And so when she called and said that Bob had stopped that because of the court hearing, um, he just lost it. So let's see what else. What did he say? He took a couple Prozacs. He remembers doing that. Um, he called his friend Michelle. He was crying, asking her to come over because he was so depressed. Because he said there was a part of him. Let me get this right. Okay. He said there was a part of him that wanted to die because he couldn't see them and he just felt like his life was over. But there was also a part of him that didn't want to die, that he was afraid to do it. So he thought, okay, I'll call Michelle. She'll come over. She'll talk me out of it. Like, I know she'll talk me out of it. And I asked him if he thought that Michelle knew that he was suicidal. And he said, oh, most definitely. Because based on, I guess, what he had said to her. Um, so he said that was another thing he felt really bad about, that, you know, he didn't wait till she got over there. But he said he knew if he waited, he would never do it. And he said he felt horrible that the maid found him. You know, he said, you don't think about that kind of stuff. But he said, I, hindsight's twenty twenty. I feel that, excuse me, I feel that way today, though. Um, so he said he literally was sitting on the floor thinking about Paula and Tiger. And it's so sad. So he was sitting on the floor and he pretty much decided that I'm done. I don't want to live with this pain anymore. I'm, yeah. Here's another one that said, you know, I felt so alone. I, yeah, it's crazy how, you know, you get these musicians and you assume that they have such a great life, you know, but deep down it's, you know, they, they're people too. And they have a lot more pressure on them for different reasons than what normal, us normal people do. But yeah, so he said, you know, had he have, not continued to drink throughout the night into the next morning, he said he would have never been able to do it because he said there were other times when he wanted to do it, but he wasn't high enough or drunk enough. And so he would just chicken out. So, yeah, so we talked chit chat a little bit more. Um, he just talks about how different things are today and how different they are where he is and how much he appreciates, you know, where he is today. And he feels like he's really like grown a lot and 
he's learned a lot. So, yeah. So he's happy, gets to be with his family. Um, he checks in on his daughter all the time. You know, so, yeah. He was talking about his little brother, you know. Yeah, I was talking about his bandmates. I mean, yeah, but it was it was really good. It was a great connection. He was a cool guy. Um, yeah, I, I like I like doing these readings like with you know famous people that have passed because it's kind of like gives me a little reprieve from doing uh, when I do you know the people that are missing and that have been, been murdered and. It's hard, you know, it's tough. So I kind of like the break that I get, you know, doing these. So, all right, guys, listen, be nice, be kind, stay safe, wear your mask, uh, follow the directions that your town, your city, your state, your country, whatever they're telling you to do, do it because we don't, none of us need to die, right? We don't need to die. It doesn't make sense to die over something like this, you know? So, yeah, so, I hope y'all are having a good week and stay safe. And that about does it for me. Bye guys.